Okay, um, I'm John Villasenor. I'm, uh, I'm with the Brookings Institution. I'm also a professor of engineering and public policy at UCLA. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the next uh, portion of our program here, which is a 45-minute discussion on can cryptocurrencies be controlled. Um, so I'm going to um, start by just, I'll introduce panelists in, in a moment, but I'll start by trying to get a level setting that um, we're, we're sort of looking long term and we're looking kind of in the immediate term. Uh, it, it, I think the first internet message was sent in 1969, if I've got that right, and if five years later um, you had been asked in 1974 to predict exactly where that would go, uh, it would have been very, very difficult. So um, Bitcoin, or, or more generally distributed um, uh, you know, virtual currencies, distributed uh, cryptographic currencies have been around basically for five years. So I, I think, at least I like to have a lot of humility uh, when trying to prognosticate exactly how or where it, may, where it may go and to keep an open mind. That said, we have a very immediate task or, or, or uh, in terms of regulation, right? The, the regulators can't wait for the next three or four decades to see how these things shape up. So to that uh, question, we're gonna be talking about um, the challenges facing uh, regulators and to what extent uh, discrete uh, cryptocurrency should be regulated. So I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists. I'll start. Uh, immediately to my right is Carol Van Cleef, who is a partner in the Washington, D.C. Uh, office of Manat, Phelps, and Phillips, if that's correct, that's just, correct. just since last week, right? As so of yesterday. As of yesterday. So I've got that right. And she's, uh, she counsels banks, money service businesses, payments, and other financial services companies on anti -money, AML, anti-money laundering compliance. Uh, and has also advised uh, uh, clients extensively on issues relating to alternative and emerging electronic payments products, including uh, digital and virtual currencies, mobile payments, uh, and so on. Immediately to her right is uh, Simon Johnson, who I will not uh, introduce again since uh, we have just heard from him uh, about an hour ago. And then to his right is John Collins, who is a professional staff member uh, for the U.S. Uh, Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, and among other things, uh, if, I, if I've got this right, uh, there's a government-wide inquiry on what, what, what they're calling virtual currencies, and you're the lead staff member for HSGAC on that inquiry, so it's is very steeped uh, in this. So I'll get to my questions. A very quick uh, vocabulary note, because we hear these things, vo virtual currencies, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies. So um, many people don't like the term virtual currency because you know, these things are actually being used to buy real things. I will use that to the extent that I'm describing what the regulators are doing because that is the term that the regulators have been using. But in using that, I'm not making a statement that I think that's necessarily the right term, but, but I will nonetheless use it because uh, that's the point of reference for these discussions. So with that, um, with that uh, framing, uh, maybe uh, regulation is obviously a topic that's going to fill this 45 minutes and uh, days and weeks and months and years in the future, but do you have sort of a three-sentence take on the best way to approach the regulation of non-fiat digital currencies, or as the, as the Fed says, uh, virtual currencies. I get to go first? You're here, yes. I think most of us don't realize that the concept of digital currency really goes back to the mid-90s. Uh, in 2008, the Department of Justice uh, prosecuted the first digital currency case. Uh, and before the judge, it said, uh, this is a uh, wild west that we're facing, and we need, to, we need to move forward on this case, which happened to be a commodity-backed currency, because we needed to get some rules out there for this area, this new frontier for money transmission. Um, it, took, it was five years later that FinCEN really uh, came in and said in an interpretive release last year, that, oh yes, by the way, virtual currency will be regulated as money transmission uh, and subject to uh, uh, FinCEN rules as if it were a money service business. Okay, great. Thank you. Simon? Well, the, the three-sentence version is that you have to worry about the protection of consumers, just like you worry about them in, in other financial contexts, and money laundering. Money laundering is a, is a legitimate, important uh, concern. Those two things have to be addressed. Thank you very much. And John? take something that uh, my boss, Chairman Carper, Carper, often says, which is sort of it's the role of government policy to steer the boat, not row the boat. So how we do that is we steer the boat uh, digital currencies away from bad actors, away from illicit activities, and those who want to play in the marketplace and steer it, uh, row it forward, have that opportunity to do so. Uh, the trick, obviously, is to create policies that allow that, that are kind of nimble and thoughtful, and I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Great, okay. So uh, FinCEN, which is uh, within uh, the Treasury, um, and uh, Carol alluded to this a moment ago, has amended its, its rules to state that the definition of, of money transmission services now includes the phrase 
other value that substitutes for money. And under that framework, FinCEN has basically identified three categories. There's virtual currency, as they call it, exchangers, people who would exchange, for example, Bitcoin for US dollars and vice versa. Um, there's administrators, uh, for example, who might be issuing uh, such currencies. And then there's users, people who just receive them or, or, or convert, say, dollars into Bitcoin, use the Bitcoin to buy something, and then at some point uh, perhaps uh, sell that for Bitcoin or dollar. So basically what uh, FinCEN has said that uh, the exchangers and the administrators are money transmitters, which means they have to comply with the requirements related to record keeping and the phrase is AML, CFT, anti-money laundering and combating financing for terrorism. Is that the right approach um, or not? If I can jump in and say that one of the problems we've got right now is if you spend any time in the Bitcoin community, you will know very quickly that uh, that separation into three different areas is far oversimplified uh, division of, of the, the community. Uh, and that there are almost as many different business models as there are people that are in the community at the moment. So the problem is, is that def those definitions don't work neatly to uh, address the issues. One of the problems we're up against right now is that there's a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to figure out whether you are a money transmitter or not a money transmitter. Um, we don't get the kind of response we need from the states to get the answer on that. And as a result of this kind of, of d demarcation, we've, we've really, we're in, a, we're in a mess right now, quite honestly, because we've got a lot of the Bitcoin exchangers, her exchangers, who have now just said, I'm out of the United States because I can't get the answers from the regulators. If I get the answers, I don't have the kind of money and the time to get the uh, regulatory structure in place. So it's forcing, people, it's forcing people offshore. And then you have others that are just spending a lot of time trying to stay out of those definitions. And what they do lose at the end of the day is they lose sight of the fact that we still have a federal statute, a criminal statute that says, basically, thou shalt not be involved in the movement of, of illegal funds to or from any, anywhere. And that, in fact, has really been lost a lot in the community. Uh, and, and we need to figure a way to sort of bring all these pieces together. Great. It has, so Vincent got it right here? Yeah. Look, <laughs> I think the Bitcoin uh, community has fallen behind the regulatory curve. They wanted to stay away from politics. They wanted to stay away from regulation. And, and now other people are defining the terms for them, and the terms don't necessarily fit. Uh, they, I would suggest, need to be more proactive and, and define who is doing what and fit that within these broad general legal principles, which are totally reasonable, like you can't finance terrorists if you want to be taken seriously. But I think they're right now at a disadvantage because they haven't wanted to take this on uh, proactively enough. May I jump in there? Because I think the issue that you have right now is, is an expense issue for those who are actually out there doing the business. For those who want to deal with it and deal with it in a correct way, um, they don't have the, the necessary funding to take it as far as, as you're suggesting they should be. I work with a number of companies like this, and they would like answers, and they've been reaching out for the answers. And in fact, I've, we have a panelist later today who has a great deal of experience in, uh, in working on that. Um, but there's a slow reaction time. Uh, that they're getting from the regulators, and this is stymieing their, their, their efforts. I think they need to organize, I'm, I mean, I don't think I need to tell this room, they should organize as a trade association, or com even better, competing trade associations like the rest of the financial sector, and bring great pressure to bear on the elected representatives. That's what works generally in this democracy. But they are trying to do that, but the problem is funding, and it takes money to organize in that kind of way and have the kind of influence and spend the time visiting people and, like and John. The, the Bitcoin community is short of money? <laughs> Uh, are you accepting Bitcoin for payment of your services? <laughs> I'm working for free today. <laughs> Do you have something, John? So I think, you know, f taking a step back, I mean, there, there are folks whose uh, jobs and missions are in this uh, uh, city here and throughout the, the, the country to protect the financial system, to protect consumers. And so we have set up uh, rules and regulations to do that. And I think law enforcement and financial regulators took a look at this technology and they said, okay, we need to set up checkpoints. And those checkpoints are gonna be at the point in which the digital economy and the uh, physical economy intersect. And so that has happened at the exchange level, it's happened at the administrator level with certain digital currencies, and it's happened with uh, certain other uh, businesses that have been set up as money service businesses. And I think you so sort of have a question, you know, a real reality of resources versus, um, you know, enforcement. Um, this is, while sort of a growing experiment, still a pretty small part of an overall financial system, which is, which is very large. Um, so uh, does, does FinCEN have it right? I think 
at this point, um, it's unless other folks have better ideas, I think it's it seems to make sense right now. Okay. And what about users of, of virtual or what FinCEN calls virtual currencies? So right now, for example, um, if, if using a U.S. dollar, somebody is making, for example, a real estate purchase and does a wire transfer for hundreds of thousands of dollars, then that you know, regular U.S. dollar wire transfer, that gets reported and, and noted and, and, and so on. Um, but of course, if a similar size transfer is done in the, in the Bitcoin or any uh, virtual currency ecosystem, there is no reporting and, and oversight. Should there be reporting and oversight of very large uh, financial transfers? And, and then, of course, if so, how would that possibly be accomplished given the, the decentralized nature of, of some of these currencies? So I think Bitcoin is, is while not, uh, it's pseudonymous as most of folks in here are probably aware. I mean, it's more traceable than cash, theoretically. I mean, it's more, it's more traceable than cash. I think uh, anyone who sort of was watching the seizure of the Silk Road funds, you know, there were folks on Reddit who identified where those funds had gone uh, within hours and identified what I guess we can assume to be an FBI wallet. Um, in terms of sort of how you, you concentrate on the users, again, I think, you know, the current regulatory scheme has been set up to identify, you know, again, that point of exchange, that checkpoint. Um, you know, I think, you know, what we've been talking to law enforcement and other folks about is sort of, you know, is there anything else that you guys need or anything you guys are thinking down the line? You know, I would not be surprised if at some point there is discussion about currency transaction reports, perhaps, for, for Bitcoin or other digital currencies. For Where users, not necessarily. Right. So if you're going to go in exchange, you're going to put $10,000 into exchange in the same way that if I took $10,000 in cash to a bank, I would have to fill up paperwork and that, that bank would have to fill up paperwork. The same perhaps could be applied to uh, secure cold storage, which is, uh, for folks who don't know, essentially safety deposit boxes for, for Bitcoin online. Um, that does not seem to me, John Collins sitting here outside the realm of possibility, or frankly to be terribly onerous for, for some of these businesses um, who I think have a responsibility not only to protect their customers, but to uh, protect the financial s system as You're well. You're talking about the exchanges. What I was talking about, once it's already in the system. So if I, if I put in $100,000 through an exchange, at that moment, of course, that's going to be subject, right. even now, right? It's got to be, uh, re there's reporting requirements. So once it's there, if I then take 80,000 of those dollars, or the equivalent thereof, in some virtual currency, and I move it to someone else, then the exchanges are out of the picture, right? There is no, there is no mechanism for reporting that. And my question is, should there be? Right. And, and if so, how? And you're right, it's synonymous, but that doesn't mean it's easy to trace mm -hmm. the, the identities, right? No, that's correct. That's um, correct. And I think there was some people in this room may know better than I did. There was a, uh, a, um, a case earlier in no November, December, where <coughs> overseas there was a, mar a, a black market site where it was sort of shut down and took thousands of bitcoins with it, and people were sort of trying to chase those bitcoins around the internet, uh, and, and I think ended up sort of running into some dead ends. But so. I do think one way that you might be able to do that, and, I, and again, this is, uh, it's important to remember this is sort of a protocol in its infancy, and the businesses around it are still in their infancy. And I think you will see solutions and, and folks that want to make value in this come up with solutions that, again, kind of give customer security and probably regulator security, too. Two of those ways is, you know, Coinbase, for example, when you set up a Coinbase account, they assign you a wallet. So your wallet kind of exists in their ecosystem, and they can identify you based on that because they're the one who issued it to you. I would not be surprised if uh, at some point you have other companies that develop similar ways in, in the same way that, you know, I have a bank account, and the bank identifies, they don't know what I do with the cash that I take from the ATM, but they do know that it's John Collins by two things. One, I have my ATM card, and B, I have a PIN number. Um, what I do with that cash at that point, again, it's, it's difficult to do now with cash to kind of figure out where that ha happens. But I do think you'll have solutions in folks, uh, if this continues to mainstream and, and uh, adopt itself, that, that you'll have things that pop up that kind of maybe deal with these problems. So we, have, we have a set of laws that have been in place for, since 1970 that have taken some time to flesh out uh, uh, as to how they apply in a, a uh, sovereign currency system. Um, I think we've been able, and as John, I think, very eloquently stated it, we've, we've been able to identify a number of the issues related to digital currency. And so it is going to be a matter of making the decision to just, you know, make those changes, to change definitions in the Bank Secrecy Act so that we are, uh, we are uh, reporting transactions over $10,000, uh, that other, other reporting requirements uh, are also applicable uh, in this area uh, as well. Uh, when you turn to the state, 
state laws, uh, you have the same kind of issue that we're up against because for currency exchange functions, for example, a lot of them really probably are better defined as, as, currency, as true currency exchange transactions, but the problem is many state laws uh, have defined the term to mean sovereign or fiat currency and not to incorporate this, this concept of, of digital currency. And that would be a very easy fix uh, uh, as an immediate area in, in the currency exchange or, or the digital currency exchange area. Well, let me ask a tax question because tax is an interesting topic. Uh, what are the tax consequences of the mining of bitcoins? And I'll give you um, the question is, is the creation of bitcoins a taxable event? And let me give you an argument that someone might make that the IRS would certainly take a dim view of, but they could say, um, or, or the IRS would probably take a dim view of, they could claim that mining bitcoins is like when an artist paints a picture. And that the picture has value, if it's a good artist, um, but that the act of creating it isn't itself taxable, right? The taxable event comes when the artist then sells the painting or whatever the picture and receives money, and at that point there is a tax uh, obligation. Um, and it's only when the painting is sold that, that it generates a taxable event uh, for the artist. Now, I, I suspect that would not fly with the IRS if you tried to claim that uh, mining Bitcoin had no tax consequences. But let me ask, uh, when you mine Bitcoins, you create Bitcoins that didn't exist, and all of a sudden, they're your assets. What are the tax consequences of that? Or what might they be? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to stay away from this one. Uh, you know, I think the, the IRS is working on tax guidance. They've said they're working on tax guidance. I'd expect it probably to be out in the next few months. I mean, th th there's a lot of smart people over there. I don't know if that is a specific question. Again, I mean, the FinCEN guidance, which, you know, they've been putting out what are called administrative rulings every few weeks, which are, for those of you don't, who don't know, businesses will basically send them questions asking for clarifications about the current guidance. And they will issue these as sort of blanket rules for everyone. And they issued one recently talking about mining, uh, delineating the difference between what are called hobbyist miners and industrial miners. An industrial miner is someone who sets up a warehouse of you know, computer servers somewhere in Iceland and is you know, selling Bitcoin to you know, businesses or exchanges. A uh, hobbyist miner, I guess, is if you know, I set up my computer and you know, try to chug out some Bitcoin transactions and, and hashes in my house. And you know, the, where the regulation again sort of uh, inserts itself is when uh, I try to sort of exchange that Bitcoin for, for cash. Or if I'm selling to uh, an exchange myself as sort of an industrial miner. And um, you know, I, I think what the IRS will, will likely address is sort of more fundamental concerns of you know, if I receive Bitcoin for a good or service, is that income? Or if I hold on to Bitcoin and it appreciates and then I sell it, how is that taxed? I, I suspect that will be sort of more, more along the lines of, of what uh, the IRS but, will But I guess my, my respectful pushback to that would be that receiving Bitcoin is, is more similar to things that are already, you know, if you receive other forms of compensation, then, you know, yeah. if someone pays me in gold, I still have to report that income, right? Um, whereas the, ac the idea of actually creating a currency or, or, or pieces of a currency, that's arguably newer. But I think, um, let me flip the analogy. I don't know if, if I would compare it more to a guy who's sort of seeking for metal out on the beach. So I mean, miners are essentially verifying transactions. So if you're mining, you know, you've got your metal detector on the beach, you're probably going to pick up a lot of trash, which is great, and it helps people on the beach. You might actually get a gold necklace. And does the IRS tax you for buying that gold necklace? No. Now, if you take it to the pawn shop, and it's worth over a certain amount, there's certain reporting you have to do. And that's probably an imperfect analogy. To me, that seems more sort of um, perhaps uh, accurate than maybe the painting. In, in tax systems that are more focused on value added, so almost everybody else who has a tax system except us, I, I, I think it's the case that the tax authorities are going to see that the act, this, certainly the, what the industrial miner does generates value added. You're going to be taxed on value added. Um, in our tax system, I think it's a, there's a little, more, uh, a, little, a little more wiggle room. I think as mining has become much more of a business, uh, the very least I would suggest is keep good records of what it costs to mine because mining is not inexpensive. It takes uh, computing power, it takes uh, resources, electricity, and so on. Uh, so at least you have a record for tax purposes into the future. I'll keep that in mind as I do my mining. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. I'm not actually mining. Um, 
So uh, the may I add, may I, another challenge I think is coming down the road is that uh, what we're seeing in the build out, again, in the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency community generally is the, uh, creation of platforms that are going to allow for transfers or exchanges between different types of cryptocurrencies and other types of digital currency. So where we might, uh, the IRS may come out with guidance on uh, going from Bitcoin to dollars or vice versa, uh, we, there's another challenge out there that needs to be considered as we're looking at uh, overall tax guidance. So let me ask a little bit about state level regulatory uh, actions. As many in this room are probably well aware, uh, New York State uh, has been uh, very active looking at that. In fact, we're going to hear uh, from uh, Mr. Lowski later, later, later this afternoon. Um, they've stated that, among other things, they're considering a bit license for virtual currency transactions to address, among other things, uh, anti-money laundering and also consumer protection. So the question is, is state-level licensing the right approach? Um, and to what extent is it the right approach? Because obviously there's a concern that if you get 50 potentially mutually incompatible uh, approaches to this, then that could complicate transactions that are almost always across states and even very often across international borders. So any thoughts on state licensing and the right way to do it? Well, I've done a lot of work with state licensing over the years. Um, it is 50 different states. Uh, 47 have laws that m regulate money transmission. Uh, we really have 40 different, 47 different state laws because each one of them has a different glitch to it. When you're talking about something that's delivered on the computer or, or internet, you're in not only all 50 states instantly, you're also in every country in the world almost instantly. Uh, so it is a very clumsy way to go about it. However, it's right now the only infrastructure we have for regulating something like this and efforts to move towards a federal solution uh, for money transmission more generally uh, has been tried for the last 20 plus years without success. I, I, I would say a state approach makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, my worry would be that the states, uh, as in some other instances, would, would compete to have uh, less sensible, less effective, uh, less complete uh, regulatory systems and transactions might move in that direction. I, I think it's good that Mr. Lorsky will be here to speak for himself at 2 o'clock. I think it's good he's taking the initiative on this. And at least well, from what I've seen, the principles that his office is articulating are, are pretty reasonable. Well, it's important to note, though, that uh, what we're talking about is the states have taken an extra, extra uh, territorial uh, jurisdiction over these models. So you don't need a license in just one state. You need it in every state where you are touching residents in that state. So that's where it becomes a very clumsy and very expensive proposition because not only do you have to go through a licensing process in each one of those states, but you also are subject to annual examinations as well as uh, ongoing fees uh, in each of those states. So that's where it's a real problem for these young companies because they don't have the minimum net worth they need to go into it and maintaining and supporting that kind of a regulatory structure is very difficult. Uh, Chairman Carper was a governor for eight years uh, of the state of Delaware and calls himself a recovering governor. So I think anytime states are, <laughs> are involved, I think he, he calls them laboratories of democracy. You know, I think, I think it's good to have states like New York and California, sort of big states that have a lot of expertise and have a lot of more resources than I think certainly small states like Delaware and others are kind of getting in, facilitating this dialogue now. And, and I think, you know, from our perspective on the government affairs side, you know, what we want to make sure is that the feds are talking to the states and the states are talking to each other so that we do have at least some sort of national norms in terms of, uh, you know, how these are going to be interpreted and, and treated. Yeah, presumably if the states are competing, Carol, uh, and, and, we talk, and the big states are, are playing in this, and, and if they establish a, a regulatory framework that makes sense, that enables um, people who live, for example, just in their states to transact in a, in a way that uh, reduces costs and people feel good about, that puts the, exactly the right kind of competitive pressure on, on other states to, to follow suit. So I think you can have a healthy uh, competition between regulators. The problem is something direction. like that takes time. And this is a technology that time is the enemy. Uh, as it's unfolding, uh, you know, to wait for that type of process to unfold, it could take two, three, five years. But, but what exactly is the rush? What are we missing or, or, or losing if, if we don't well, proceed more methodically? We're losing the fact that I said earlier that we have a number of exchangers who have already moved offshore uh, because they, and they've just decided we can operate and we can function outside the United States and uh, the U.S. consumer is uh, theoretically being uh, denied the right, uh, the ability to uh, work with, you know, well-run, well-organized organizations that are in fact appropriately regulated. So, so I, I guess that there's a trade-off then between providing the opportunity to the consumer sooner 
which, which I agree is, is sensible, and, and being comfortable that uh, the money transfer business, or whatever you want to call it, is consistent with sensible, reasonable, for example, anti-money anti laundering concerns, or this concerns about large, just about large amounts of money passing through the system. Um, so yes, perhaps you, you can't have everything instantly, and, and perhaps uh, we've become a little accustomed to that with the uh, with internet technologies. But I, I don't see that the losses are, are are enormous relative to having a sensible framework in place. Well, I, there is a framework in place, and you know, sensibility. Yes, it's sensible the way it has functioned over the years. Uh, the problem is, and we've seen this pressure coming in other ways because we now have money transmitter models that uh, you know used to be there were only a couple that really were 50 state models. Uh, increasingly, we've had money transmitter large companies who have internet businesses that have gotten licensed and are maintaining that kind of a structure. Um, uh, again, they have a lot of resources to bring that to bear. What we're doing, I think, at the end of the day is we're really, we are hindering our, our, our um, competitive, uh, our technology development. Uh, because there's, if, I don't know if you've ever attended a Bitcoin conference, but I've been to a number, and the kind of energy that exists in a room uh, with big, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency uh, individuals is unbelievable. I have not seen anything rivaled at any other type of conference. And what we're doing is we're, we're strangling that, that, that technology development. Uh, in the US. But, but Carol, you could say the same thing about biotech. I don't know if you go to biotech conferences as well, but the energy around biotech and new medical, medical innovation, medical devices is, is enormous. And, and it is absolutely limited, slowed, restricted by our regulatory system. Now, those regulations exist for, for good reason. And I think that the smart people in that industry uh, think that it's better not to have the scandals. It's better not to introduce the drugs that result in terrible birth defects. You're better off having an FDA process that people regard as legitimate and, and that is going to protect the investors ultimately. Now I understand we don't have that in place yet for uh, the virtual currencies, but I think moving towards a system like that that encourages innovation but also protects the industry against egregious abuse, private or, 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 or any other form of abuse, that, that seems like it's in the best industry, I I interest of the industry itself ultimately. Well, I'm not saying that what we're, uh, I, I'm not sure that we're going to gain a lot in terms of further protection of, of uh, the U.S. consumer uh, or U.S. business by uh, waiting for these slow developments to occur. Now, I think it is encouraging that the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, for example, has taken the lead in trying to push forward uh, um, more cooperation amongst the states uh, in this area. Uh, so there are things that are happening, and I have to give the Bitcoin community, you made your comment earlier about the, the lobbying, that there is a great deal of energy again in trying to push these changes through. Uh, unlike anything I've ever seen, and clearly unlike anything in the in the financial services industry, um, uh, but it's it is a, it's a slow process, and I'm not sure that we are gaining a lot by by waiting. I think that the community would like some rules. You know, here are the rules, and they're ready to play by it. They're building in in many of these many of these systems. They've built in AML compliant anti money laundering compliance regimes that are better than many existing financial services companies, well beyond them. And they're not afraid to build it and incorporate it. They're not dealing with legacy systems uh, uh, technologically. Uh, so I think there's actually a lot to be gained by, by helping these companies move forward. I want to, I'm sorry, I was going to open it to questions, but you, okay. So I think we have a, a few minutes, 15 minutes left. I want to open up to uh, questions from the floor. We've got a gentleman in the back, I see. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll walk the mic around. Um, as appropriate. And uh, remember, please to uh, identify yourself uh, and um, before you ask a question. Hi, my name is Sean Andrews. Hi, my name is Sean Andrews. Uh, I uh, run a Bitcoin Teller Machine Distributors. I can attest to what Carol's speaking to. Uh, I'll be putting my first machine not in the United States. It's too difficult to figure out uh, which states I, I, I can go to, which states I can't. If you just look at the money transmission laws between Maryland and Virginia, they're, uh, they're very, very, very different. Um, I'd like, uh, uh, as an entrepreneur and as an investor, uh, potentially maybe some kind of definitions from uh, FinCEN that make a little bit more sense as opposed to guidelines that seem to change from month to, you know, several months down the road. Um, and uh, I would just appreciate if you could comment on uh, when do you think you might 
we might see some kind of standards among the states as opposed to the, what the MSB, uh, MSB Association is trying to do with uh, voluntary uh, participation. Um, I think that uh, I think we're in the early stages, quite honestly, and hopefully Mr. Losky will have a little bit more information. Uh, as I said earlier, the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, which is sort of the umbrella organization for the state banking regulators who have, in many states, they have the money transmitter uh, regulatory systems reporting up through them. They are really trying to exercise some leadership, uh, but I see that as, as taking, you know, a year or two years minimum uh, to really bring, to bring together the kind of coordination. What would be nice, and I'd be interested in John's thoughts on this, is whether there is any chance we might see a law like the one that was passed in uh, 1994, I believe, the Regal Neal uh, Act, which uh, uh, took us to a better system for regulating internet banking in the U.S., where we were allowed to designate one state to be the primary regulator. Uh, and, and then uh, to the extent that someone was operating in other states, that, that uh, the other states could look to that primary regulator. Do you, John, think there's any chance we might see something like that? <laughs> uh, you know, it's difficult for us to name post offices right now. So I, I, I don't know if, it, it would, if we would be able to, to pull that. But I, I do think, going back to, to sort of the, the conversation about the state bank supervisors and going back to sort of my earlier points, you know, I do think that um, the leadership that they've shown is important. I mean, you know, these, these laws and these regulations were put in place for, for a reason. It's because, you know, these instruments, these businesses are taking people's money and, and we need to be able to trust them. And um, I do think sort of the ability of New York and California and other folks to kind of set up that dialogue for these bank supervisors and for my brothers and sisters in government, you know, going out to visit um, Coinbase or any number of these other sort of uh, Bitcoin businesses is very different than going to visit a Western Union uh, stand, okay? And that's sort of what that model has been set up. So we're really trying to, do, to kind of reinvent the examination rubric here. And I think it's gonna take a little bit of time. Again, you know, uh, something that, that my boss talks about all the time is sort of, you know, again, going, following that model from the early 90s, the, the Clinton e-commerce directives and, and trying to sort of formulate that nimble and thoughtful policy. It's a lot easier said than done. But the thoughtful part is, is as important as the nimble part at times. And striking that balance is important. Thanks very much. So we'll another, is the gentleman we got. And, and, then, and then I think after him, we've got the gentleman in the third row here. Warren Coates, retired from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, you've talked about taxation, prudential regulation, and so on. I want to lift out the AML CFT part of that uh, and suggest I would like to see you take a big step back and ask what kind of regulation really is beneficial and makes sense. None of us who work in that area uh, believe that the cost-benefit assessment comes even remotely close to yielding benefits close to the e enormous cost. So is your question that AML CFT is, o o your position is that it's onerous generally? And yes. You know that means. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, as I yes, mentioned before, anti-money laundering, combating financing for terrorism. Right. If U.S. dollars are used to finance terrorism, do we sue the Federal Reserve? Okay, so is, this, is that the question? If U.S. dollars are used to finance terrorism, <laughs> do no, we no, that was rhetorical. <laughs> <laughs> we don't sue the Federal Reserve. Uh, we, yeah, we don't. So I'm trying to, but but, but the, I'm sorry. Can you articulate the question for the panel? Do you have a specific? I, question? I have an interpretation of the question, um, uh, but he can he can not shake his head, which is. Um, so, so one, one thing we've been discussing is whether these rules should be applied evenly across existing old technologies uh, and, and the new cryptocurrencies. I think the question is about whether uh, the anti-money laundering uh, and anti-terrorism rules themselves are, are onerous and inappropriately costly for everyone, old technology or new technology. Okay. Anyone want to uh, take a cut at that one? or? I'm more than happy to jump in because I spend a lot of time in this area. Um, I often say I don't really care whether you're subject to the FinCEN regulations. You know, keep in mind what I mentioned earlier about the federal criminal statute, that you're really not supposed to be involved in illegal activity uh, or moving the funds associated, the value associated with that illegal activity. That really should be sort of the guiding principle here. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you take that into mind, I, one of the reasons we've had the build out of the rules that we have is because quite honestly, 
and this may be sacrilegious to say this, but people haven't taken that responsibility seriously, even our biggest financial institutions. Uh, and so uh, we've had to be much more proscriptive in what it is we require people to undertake uh, and do. Uh, interesting case that came out indictment two weeks ago right before the New York hearings uh, involved a, a young man, 24 years old, who uh, his company went ahead and registered, a Bitcoin company registered as an MSB and was subject to, had its full AML compliance program in place. But at the end of the day, he has been indicted for allegedly being involved in uh, working with someone who had clear criminal intent or allegedly clear c criminal intent uh, related to the system. So you can have all the rules in the place that you want to. It's still not going to necessarily um, uh, change. It may change behavior. It may cause people to look for those activities more so. But it's not going to necessarily be the, the game changer for behavior. Okay. Well, one point I would make. Um, uh, or the Bitcoin community might make is exactly with regard to how the rules are enforced on, on, on today's dominant players, which are very large international financial institutions. You know, we're, <coughs> when, when, the rules have, when the rules have been broken in a flagrant, repeated manner, as by HSBC or Standard Chartered, for example, do you really think the penalties that are exacted on those institutions are going to change their behavior going forward? I'm, I'm skeptical, and I think there should be more, more discussion, more polit political discussion around that from people who want to uh, at least have the system operate in a fair way across different kinds of businesses. I do think, and I'm going to borrow some language that Jeremy Allaire, who um, is an entrepreneur and testified at uh, our committee's hearing a few months ago, said, you know, it's one thing if me and a few buddies want to build a photo sharing app in my garage to not maybe have a lot of government regulation over that. But if I want to build a financial institution, then I probably should be able to have a reputation that I can raise the capital or that I can hire the lawyers, or that I can do all of the things that financial institutions need to do to play in that space. And I think, uh, I think that's really kind of what we're talking about. So maybe we had the gentleman right here. Hi, uh, Joe Colangelo, Consumers Research. Uh, first of all, for Carol and John, uh, for not being academics or economi economists, amazing how much you know about Bitcoin. It was really impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, no, it's to be applauded. Um, so it's, it's gives me confidence that the people regulating it know so much. Um, jo uh, John, you talked, or Simon, you talked about there not being a sense of urgency. What's the rush in regulating? Well, you know, maybe with a seven billion dollar monetary base, there isn't much of a rush. But say Bitcoin goes to ten thousand dollars by March, we've got you know a hundred billion dollar monetary base. Um, then, it, then there is a rush, right? Um, are we going to wipe out uh, fifty billion dollars from consumers' wallets, or are we going to? Uh, you know, inc encourage the growth, right? How, wh what are we going to do then? So um, I know you're want to pro prognosticate, but if you had to say Bitcoin goes to $10,000 in March, what's the uh, United States' response? Well, I would say even if it doesn't go to $10,000, what a lot of people don't realize is there are at least 50 or more. I, last time I looked, I think it was 42, but that's probably about two months ago, uh, cryptocurrencies out there. And there are new ones that are being developed every day. So you've got other types of currencies. And there are these other um, commodity-backed currencies that are coming out, too. Um, so th there's a lot of development that's happening. What is it we're really talking about? And I think this is, you know, I, I heard the earlier discussion about uh, the, the underlying numbers. Um, but in a lot of ways, we're talking about frictionless payments. That what we're really looking for is a way that you can reduce the cost and as much of the friction that exists around our, pay, our payment system right now. And again, there's a lot of energy in it, right, and, and a lot of drive. And, and again, the Bitcoin community is unlike anything I've ever seen before in pushing forward, pushing its, its a, if there's even an agenda, but pushing forward with the development. Um, so I think that there is a certain degree of urgency uh, and putting aside all of the economic, uh, I'm going to be a heresy here, or economic rationale uh, or discussions uh, on it. It's just, this is a tech build out we've got going on. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that part of what Carol said, and I agree with the very important point about the, the competition between alternative uh, cryptocurrencies, that that, that uh, ecosystem is healthy and I think sensible. I don't, I don't quite get the question. If it goes to 10,000, if, if it goes to, okay, I won't say a number, I might be quoted on that, higher than 10,000, uh, it's an asset that people buy, and, and if, if the value of uh, rare paintings or um, other artifacts that people buy goes up, goes down, I don't think that ch should change 
uh, the trajectory of, of, of regulatory policy. You should be, have a sensible policy irrespective. It's not money right now. It's, it's not legal tender. It is something that some people accept for transactions and, and other people don't. Carol was actually saying to me earlier how difficult it is for, um, I mean, that was the, the premise of, of, of what you were saying earlier, how difficult it is for businesses in the Bitcoin space to generate uh, cash revenue in, in dollars that they can then put into the political process. So this is, this is not money. This is an important, interesting technological development. I, I think it's leading in a, in, a, in a healthy direction. Don't make the mistake, would be my, my suggestion, on either side, um, both the industry and, and the regulatory side, of, of being rushed in, into doing things. That will uh, lead to scandals and misbehavior and, and damage the, the, the reputation of the broader industry. I think that everyone in the industry should want that reputation to develop in, in a healthy way. Yeah, and, and I do think, you know, government, I think, law enforcement specifically, is not really focused on the technology as much as the uses of the technology, right? You know, using it to money launder, or using it for other illicit activities. I do think if the market cap was to grow to that uh, extent, you know, right now it's difficult to, to send really large transactions of Bitcoin or, or, or to, to do money laundering. Theoretically, if the market cap got bigger, it would theoretically, I think, law enforcement, I think, would be more concerned about that possibility. So I think there's a lot of ways to launder money that are a lot easier than, than Bitcoin that organized criminals and others do throughout the world every day. But I do think it would probably be on law enforcement's um, radar more, which I do think is, is another reason kind of to go off with, with Carol and why I think my boss and others have been trying to push a dialogue among uh, federal agencies and, and officials and, and states is to sort of, you know, build that sort of infrastructure, build that regulatory framework early so that we do sort of have uh, a little more confidence in, in the build out if it is to build out going forward. One other comment, if it does go to 10,000, the higher the price of Bitcoin goes, the less likely it is to become the medium of exchange. And you will see others uh, sitting on top of Bitcoin or otherwise, like, whether it's Litecoin or uh, P2P coin and so on, that, that would uh, potentially become the, the medium of exchange. OK, so well, there's lots more that could be said, but uh, we're running about off time here. So let's thank our panelists for a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much.